All right, let's go ahead and get started, folks. I am Alan Monette. I am part of the cybersecurity team here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm pleased to introduce Brendan O'Connor, who is described by coworkers as not the lawyer we need, but the lawyer we deserve. Brendan is a security researcher and consultant. He is also admitted to the Montana Bar and serves as vice chair of the ABA's Information Security Committee. While he is not a lawyer, he, while he is a lawyer, he is not your lawyer. He is a proud graduate of University of Wisconsin's law school. Brendan. Hi. Countries are fighting a war. Almost, right? Countries are really, they're not technically fighting a war, right? You can't fight here. This is the war room. They're fighting a virulent disagreement very loudly over the future of the internet. They're doing so in a variety of areas. Freedom of expression is one such fight. On the one hand, we have countries that believe in almost unlimited freedom of expression. These are countries like the United States, where the communication right is paramount and almost everything else just falls away. On the other hand, we have countries that believe in the right of privacy over the right of free speech. And despite a few very confusing U.S. Supreme Court rulings, we actually don't do very much of a right of privacy in the United States, not compared to international norms. So these other countries where privacy is over free speech are countries like the European Union or supranational entities like the European Union. Surveillance of networks and people and transfer of weapons are two more actually very closely related areas. We have countries that are allied with the Western powers ideals of what a weapon is and what information you can spread about it. And then we have countries that are not, like Russia and China. Closely related to this, we have countries that are allied with U.S. intelligence apparatus, the so-called Five Eyes countries. And then we have the entire rest of the world who really hates that apparatus. They're not, and all these groups are slightly different, but they have a lot of the same key players. Perhaps the most fundamental disagreement is over who should determine what the right answer is for whatever question is being asked about the future of the Internet. We have some countries like Russia and China that ex exercise extreme controls over the internet for the clearly stated purpose of censorship. This also includes the United Kingdom with its so-called Great Firewall of Cameron. We also have some countries that want corporations to exercise the same sort of control. And this is really the argument that's being held up when people say, my God, Facebook should censor videos of X for whatever X is currently ticking people off. Or alternately, when people say, net neutrality is a communist propaganda that threatens our economy. That's the same argument, essentially. We should have corporations decide what information is allowed to be on the internet. Finally, we have political groups like the Pirate Party, which is a relatively important but extreme minority party in certain countries in Europe, or the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, which some of you may know is a hilarious group of internet libertarians that decided to use Bitcoin to replace lawyers and lost 50 million US dollars because it turns out that lawyers are like debuggers but for contract law. Uh, so I loved this personally because I think Bitcoin is silly and I think that lawyers are good because I'm a lawyer. This is one of those things that happens. Um, so this is always fun, right? These people seem to be dedicated to the idea that the Internet is somehow a higher plane of existence, that it can exist free from governments and free from corporations at the same time, which does leave a question as to who's buying all those very expensive routers. But that's fine. Let's move along. Laws and regulations, and occasionally holding major corporations in contempt of court, are how governments attempt to shape the internet to their will. You may fall on different sides of the issues we're going to discuss today from me, and that's fine. But the purpose of this talk is to show you the many different, like, show you many different battlegrounds at once, and to explain why our open system of communication that we've always held up as such a paragon of virtue isn't. So when you're done with this talk, I'm hoping you have a few critical takeaways. First, that you understand some of the largest threats that are happening right now. These are existential threats to the way we currently think of the internet. What they are, who's backing them, and why they're doing so. It's not just because they're evil. Right? Understand that there also aren't traditional bad guys. Right? Different countries will fall on different sides of exactly the same issues. But of course, it's one thing when we're the good guys, and it's another thing when we're the bad guys. Um, and there's nobody has all the right answers. I, I have all the right answers, but no particular country has endorsed all the right answers yet. 
And finally, know what's at stake in these otherwise considered boring policy discussions. And I want you to participate in them, either as leaders of your information technology groups, because, you know, honestly, we need a lot more small organizations participating in these policy discussions. And there are groups like NTIA, which is part of the Department of Commerce, who you just heard talking earlier, that are actively soliciting participation in some of these policy debates. Or alternately, participating in these policy debates as a technology creator, somebody building the new technology. Like, for instance, MIT just released a prototype that they hope will eventually replace Tor. It'll deal with some of the um, fundamental problems with the Tor protocol called Riffle. That's a great way to push forward the discussion of privacy by simply building privacy and then saying, what are you going to do about it? This is the Moxie Marlin Spike approach, for those of you who know him. So me. So hi, I'm an engineer. Um, I have two degrees in computer science because I'm a nerd. Um, I'm also a lawyer because I'm more of a nerd than before. I'm admitted as an attorney in Montana. I actually took the bar, unlike some lawyers in Wisconsin you might have heard of. Um, I also serve currently as vice chair of the ABA Information Security Committee, which is an epic demonstration of the reasons that committees don't get things done. Um, that's fine. I currently work as a security consultant. I'm based out of Seattle. Finally, one more note as part of the introduction. I feel like I should take a moment to address the keynote this morning. It is flatly unacceptable to say that real geeks are not the beautiful people. <laughs> and that somehow, and even more disturbing to me, that the, somehow that the beautiful people aren't worthy, quote unquote, to work in security. This is exactly the kind of exclusionary, unacceptable language that our community already has far too much of already. As we had a talk earlier today talking about exactly this problem. I've put a picture on the slide of one group of beautiful people. This was my exam team at the DEF CON 22 ham radio exams. This group of people spends their, they're not only security experts, but they spend their free time talking with people who aren't like them to expand our community, its interests, and its integration with the rest of the world. They include men and women. They include people younger than 21 and people older than 70, including one grandmother who we heard during the keynote couldn't possibly be taught to use Bitcoin. She does use Bitcoin, in case you're wondering. She's pretty great. They know, and so I hope do all of you, that the way we secure systems isn't to pretend that we're better than people who don't work in security. It's to reach out to people who don't look like and or think like us and add their perspective to our own. That is, in fact, a primary reason I wanted to give this talk, to bring the perspectives and actions of people who don't live in security every single day, but whose actions do affect us to this conference so that we can all learn from the big, wide world where lots of fleshy people live. On that happy note, let's begin. We'll start by first talking about this word that if you don't know what it is already, you may not know how to pronounce. The pronunciation is Wassenaar. Wassenaar is a suburb of The Hague, which some of you might have heard of the, for the first time in 2002 when George W. Bush proposed that we invade it, but that's fine. It's a thing. We didn't invade it. That's a good thing. It's flat. It's, very lar it's not very large. It's very picturesque in a sort of Dutch way. And a friend of mine and I flew across an ocean and took a long train ride so that we could take pictures of ourselves sitting in its town square using computers. Unfortunately, we went there and we were like hoping that there's some kind of large, big, welcome to Wassenaar sign, as though it were Las Vegas. Unfortunately, it's not Las Vegas, and the nice Dutch people there were very confused when we tried to explain to them what we were looking for. So instead, we were sitting in the main fountain in the main square just outside the big old church in Wassenaar. So why on earth did we care enough to do this? Well, there's this thing called the Wassenaar Arrangement, which does sound a little bit like a romantic comedy involving two young Dutch people being set up on a date. And they will have crazy hijinks, right? Unfortunately, the subtitle clarifies that that's not what it is. It is the Wassenaar Arrangement on Export Controls for Conventional Arms and Dual-Use Goods and Technologies. So, not a rom-com. Uh, it is interesting because it is not, in fact, a treaty. You notice that it says arrangement. It doesn't say treaty or convention or protocol. Or There's about 17 synonyms in international law for treaty, but it's none of those. Instead, membership in the Wassenaar Arrangement means that countries have to take the rules that the Wassenaar Arrangement agrees on back to their home countries and implement them either through the legislative process or through the regulatory process. This is, in effect, mean girls as an international cartel. If you don't do what the cool kids say, you don't get to be part of the cool kids anymore. It's not ratified, never has been ratified by states' parties, because it's not a treaty. It's just a thing. So the point of Wassenaar is that it controls the arms trade, right? And on face, that this is a good thing, right? This keeps modern weapons, like cruise missiles, from getting into the hands of bad people. It's an economic carrot and stick system. Participating countries can only buy, trade in arms, for instance, buy cruise missile bits, 
from other participating country. That means that if your country wants to sell cruise missile parts to a participating country, you have to join. And the list of countries that you want to sell things to is large and important. And essentially, you have the entire global north, plus Argentina, South Africa, and Turkey, and missing mostly Belarus, Moldova, Albania, and the former Yugoslav states. Also missing Iceland, which means that Iceland's large standing economy, I think they're up to 10 people now. They're very nice, by the way. I got to meet them. You can just walk into their parliament building. It's not like our parliament building at all. It's also about it's significantly smaller than this building, so it's pretty funny. So Iceland's large standing army cannot buy cruise missiles, but Greenland can. So if Greenland decides that what it needs is a little tiny bit more of an island, they can invade uh, Iceland with great big weapons. Also, you notice that, China, that basically all the large standing armies are on this list except for China, but Russia is on this list. Also, things like Mexico are on this list, and Mexico, of course, has a large standing army. But the reason Mexico joined, and they only did it a couple years ago, was because they wanted Raytheon and Lockheed and other major arms manufacturers to build factories in Mexico. And again, if you want to trade in internationally restricted arms parts, you have to join the arrangement. So Wassenaar is updated annually, and big updates tend to happen every few years. In December 2014, the Wassenaar meeting put out a change that added intrusion software to the list of controlled software. Now, to be clear, even though it's arms things and dual-use goods, they do include software, and they have for a long time. I'll give you an example. GPS interpretation software, that is the thing that takes lots of little GPS uh, satellites that are screaming, not you are there, but I am up here in space, and translates it into a I am here, that software is generally available, but you can't trade in it over borders if you make software that can go at more than 600 miles an hour or so and more than about 60,000 feet. And the reason for that is that the only thing that does both at the same time are missiles. High, like extremely high altitude balloons tend to do less than a few hundred miles an hour, but more than 60,000 feet. Jetliners or extremely high speed land transport tends to go more than a few hundred miles an hour, but at lower than 60 feet. We don't have commercial passenger jets that tra travel that high. So the only things that do tend to be stamped with the military of the X, right? So this year they added intrusion software to the list. So here's a quick question. What does intrusion software mean? They included a definition, but the definition included changing the execution path of a program. Okay, now how many of you have ever written code? About half the room, okay. So and the, even those of you who have it will understand this basic concept. We change the execution path of a program every time we use an if statement. If this, then do that. That changes the path, it moves us in the flow chart. But they said, well, you have to unintentionally change, the, or not with the intention of the author, change the execution path of a program. Well, that would include a debugger. And debuggers really did fall into the definition. I'm not just making this up. There were huge papers from universities like Dartmouth that should know better saying, my god, you're going to destroy information security. And they're like, yeah, we know. That's what we want. <laughs> what? <laughs> it got much worse, though. Any information traveling again over borders, that's where this applies, on vulnerabilities was, was uh, controlled under the Wassenaar. That means that if you're a security researcher and you find a vulnerability in a site in another country, you can't tell them because it goes over a border. So what you would have to do if you find, if you are, for instance, in a Indian researcher uh, trying to report a bug on an American website, for instance, if you use Bug Crowd or Hacker One or any other bug bounty program, this is primarily it, right? Most of those companies' customers are American companies, and most of those companies' researchers are in India and Pakistan. There's a few others, but those are the biggest ones. So you can't just directly tell them. Instead, you have to go to your government and ask for a license to export this controlled munitions technology. And there are concerns in many countries, such as ours, that if you go to your government and say, I would like to apply for an export license, they will say, very cool, please tell us what you're applying for an export license for. And they'll say, oh, well, I say, I found this vulnerability where if I do X, then Y happens on this site. And they'll say, that's great. This will take us about six months of paperwork to process, so you just sit there. And then they'll immediately hand out all of that information to the National Security Agency or whatever domestic intelligence company or uh, organization you have. This concerns people for fairly obvious reasons we don't really have to get into. So anything that doesn't have a license would be controlled and therefore illegal. You would be an international merchant of death if you, for instance, flew overseas to present new research at a security conference or responsibly disclosed a bug or even downloaded any of a number of free software tools to help fix your own company's security, like Metasploit. This would all be illegal. 
So the entire security community exploded over this, and it took a year of fighting by professors and researchers and international diplomats, but in 2016, the Department of State announced that they will go back to Wassenaar and negotiate for a new agreement that removes the intrusion software category. So we won, sort of, because, again, with the Mean Girls thing, it's unclear what happens. If you take a declaration like, on Wednesdays we wear pink, and everybody says that's fine, and other countries have started implementing it, which they have, and then we go back and we actually say, I'm concerned about the whole pink thing. Can we, on alternating Thursdays, wear pink instead? It's not clear what happens. They probably won't just throw the U.S. out of the cartel because it's our defense agencies that they want to sell to, but it's unclear what happens. And tricky in international law is one of those things we tend to resolve with wars. The object lesson of Wassenaar to me is that there are, in fact, shadowy international government conspiracies that wish to shape the world in their preferred model. And they meet annually in Austria. Next, let's talk about Tallinn. So, in my abstract, they actually cut most of my abstract, which is kind of too bad, but you did see cyber blood. So I promise you cyber blood, so we're going to talk about cyber blood. So first we're going to talk about the concept of cyber war, which is a term I still can't say without giggling just a little bit. But let's talk about the law of war as a whole first. And just to be clear, this is a two-minute introduction to the law of war. This is not enough to make you a, you know, a practitioner of the law of war. That's fine. Practitioners of the law of war tend to be people who have their own militaries. If you have a military, I would love to borrow it. I will give it back to you if I've rectified a few problems, and I will barely break it, I promise. If you want to learn more about the law of war, the law school here has a great course in the law of war. It's a whole semester long, and it's taught by their dean of academic affairs, Dean Kelly, who's a cool guy. So go take that. So you've likely heard of the Geneva Conventions, which are some of the foundational documents in the law of war. They deal specifically with the rights of people caught in war, whether there's, those are people fighting it, soldiers and sailors and airmen and so on, or more specifically with Geneva, the rights of people who used to be fighting it and then have become injured in some way or simply those people caught in the crossfire, whether they're medics or villagers. Also very important, however, but we talk about them less, are the Hague Conventions, which were first set out in 1899. And they dealt more with things of, like, a nature of things you can't do while actually shooting at people. And so they set out certain prohibited conduct, right? This also led to things like arms control treaties on specific weapons, things like the Landmine Convention or the Convention on Genocide or the Convention on Rape as the Weapon of War, this kind of thing, all derived from the Hague Conventions. And one importantly, incredibly important contribution of the Hague Conventions was the so-called Martins Clause, who was named after this guy, Fyodor Fyodorovich Martins, who was the leader of the Russian delegation to the Hague Conventions. And again, 1899, so we're talking czarist Russia here, just so you can kind of place this. And it said this, I'm not going to read this whole slide to you because I hate it when people do that, but essentially this says, look, if you come up with a new and exciting way of killing people that scares the bejesus out of everybody else, that's just illegal. Right? And to be clear, not just scares them, but actually horrifies them, shocks the conscience of humanity, and derogates from the laws of humanity. This is, I'm glossing over a little bit, but essentially the Martin's Clause, which has been integrated into almost every other major international human, uh, humanitarian law uh, accord, is why we were able to prosecute the Nazis for genocide. There wasn't a convention against genocide. There is now, by the way. We passed it in 58, I want to say. But before then, we just decided, yeah, exterminating an entire race is one of these things that derogates from the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. So that's just illegal on face. Then, because some countries need to get a better sense of the law, we passed a specific convention that said, no, seriously, we mean it with the genocide thing. So then, a few years ago, the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, which is NATO CCDCOE, it just rolls right off the tongue, put a bunch of nerds in a room to answer the question, what are the laws of cyber war, and in fact, are there any? And this sounds like a weird approach, right? But in international law, we put a bunch of room, nerds in a room to write a document, is a common thing. We call it a treatise. It's not binding like a treaty, although the words are annoyingly similar in English, but international courts often use these as a way of handling and exploring never-before-seen issues. And the reason for that is very simple. In the United States, if we pass a new law and we want a test case, somebody can just go break the law, right? And it can be relatively small, breaking the law, right? We have cases like Poe v. Ullman or Griswold v. Connecticut, where somebody broke a small, silly law against birth control because we wanted to see if it were real or not. And the punishment was a small fine, but we got interesting Supreme Court rulings on privacy out of this. 
if we have an international law that we want to see is real or not, we have to fight a war. Wars are bad. Citation needed. So instead of doing that, we put nerds in the room. Again, so they're not binding, but judges tend to cite to them heavily and use them as kind of a thought experiment as to what would happen if we did this. So what did Tallinn say? So they said first that there are, in fact, laws of cyber war, which is good, because a lot of people, even since Tallinn, have been saying the laws of war don't apply in cyberspace. And that tends to be followed immediately by things like, that means we can kill hackers. And then that tends to be followed immediately like, please buy our next generation firewall, which is a little scary. So there's law of war in cyberspace. So that means that if you can figure out a way to cyber shoot a medic or cyber execute hostages, that's illegal automatically, which is great, right? It's good that there is law of war, that there are generally rules and things that we prohibit. Unfortunately, then they went off the rails, and these are two of the rules where they lost the plot a little bit. So this, the experts said that cyber things are going to be an act of war when they cause damage equivalent to non-cyber things that we declare an act of war. What that means is if I drop a bomb on a foreign thing, that's an act of war. Right? It's called a use of force. But a use of force when there's no active war is called an act of war. That's how we define an aggressive war. So that's cool because it does recognize what people who work in SCADA and industrial control systems have been saying for years, which is that you can cyber people to death. If you destroy a dam, you can flood an entire valley and kill thousands of people. Right? That's good. The problem is that because of the way that the active, the active for, use of force laws have always worked, anything that's de minimis, below the definition of a use of force, isn't an act of war. So that means that anything that doesn't kill people or cause significant property damage equivalent to a bomb isn't an act of war. So the Tallinn Manual actually codified no blood, no foul as an international standard, which is a slight problem. It actually seems like Taylor Swift, noted cybersecurity expert, has really stated this well. Those of you who don't understand what the heck this is appearing in this talk for, go on Twitter. It's Swift on security. You'll be fine. So Taylor Swift has really stated this well. The only thing not digital in cyber war is the blood, or else, by Tallinn, there's no cyber war. So if it does damage, it's cyber war. So was Stuxnet cyber war? Well, maybe. I've actually noticed a real lack of get up and go by international experts on the let's declare Stuxnet an act of aggressive warfare because there's some rumors about who spread Stuxnet, and that could get awkward at the UN. <laughs> Horrifyingly, there's a brand new documentary that just came out called Zero Days, which is promoted by the tagline, Warfare in a World Without Rules, the World of Cyber War. Well, no, there are rules in cyber war. If there are no rules, it must not be cyber war. But what is it about things that don't kill people? If we take an entire country offline, is that cyber war? Nobody died. What about purely economic sabotage? And Tallinn talks about this somewhat, but comes eventually to as its answer. So we don't have any answers to these questions. We also don't have a good answer on an interesting question that sounds silly, but it's not. Can military packets pretend to be civilian packets to evade firewalls? So this sounds silly because it sounds like the evil bit, right? It sounds like the IETF proposal. It said all malicious packets must set their evil bit to one, and then firewalls can filter out the evil bit, right? So this sounds like a thing. You're going to set an American military bit or a Chinese military bit, and we're going to solve APT1. It's going to be great, right? Mandy, it's going to go out of business, but we can all agree that's a fine thing. So this isn't silly, though, and the reason is because one of the grave breaches, there's a list of six things that all countries are required by participating in the Geneva and Hague Conventions to prosecute no matter who did them. And one of those six things is the crime of perfidy, which is you put on a civilian outfit or you put on a medic's outfit and then went out and killed people as a member of a military. That's as bad as it gets under the laws of war. So if we can commit perfidy with a firewall or if a firewall somehow requires perfidy, we're in a weird situation, and it's a weird situation. The reason we don't like perfidy in the normal law of war is because it's what tends to lead to villagers getting shot. Um, so until we have real decisions on this, and ideally a strong treaty and strong Red Cross-like bodies to monitor international battlefields, which will be exciting for cyber, um, I'm hoping it looks like war games, or better yet, Tron. If all of our cyber war could look like Tron, it'll be in great shape. <laughs> so then until that happens, we all live in a war zone or technically not a war zone. It's a police action zone, which those of you um, old enough to remember, our last police action we know is also an unpleasant place to live. 
But in, militaries of the world right now can run around doing anything they want using military-created tools, and it will not necessarily be a good thing, but it will not be an act of war. And this is a problem. What's coming next? Well, NATO CCDCOE has announced that Tallinn 2.0, the second edition of this foundational document, will be released in the second half of 2016. So watch this space. If you see a lot of law nerds suddenly going, holy crap, we've invented the Cyber Red Cross, that would be good. So keep an eye on this. Next, let's talk about cross-border data transfer. You might have already heard of this, but it turns out that the internet is like a really big thing now. And we can communicate and send cat pictures anywhere in the world. So sometimes we do want to talk to other people in other countries, and even we want to send them our cat pictures so that they can, for instance, put the little caption that says, I can has cheeseburger. It turns out that other countries are better at cheeseburger adding to our photos than we are, so we would like to transfer border across, or data across borders. So we're going to talk specifically about Europe. This thing is being played out in other countries, but Europe is a really good example because people have heard of it and think they care about it, whereas people don't think they care about Canada, which is weird but true. So the EU Data Protection Directive was pushed forward in 1995. It has a wide variety of interesting bits, but you don't all care about all of them. I've read the whole thing, but so that you don't have to. So I'm just going to summarize two things. These are the two issues we want to talk about today from the DPD. The first one looks confusing, and part of the confusion is because Europe and basically everyone but uh, the United States conceives of privacy law in, in a very different way than the U.S. In the U.S., we don't have a general privacy law. Those of you who are dealing with HIPAA on a daily basis are going to go, oh, just a minute, I got this. Now, HIPAA constrains organizations. You have to be one of three categories, right? You have to be a healthcare provider, you have to be an information clearinghouse, or you have to be an insurance company, essentially, or a rebuilder in order to be covered by HIPAA. If you're not, HIPAA doesn't apply to you. If you have medical data you didn't get from one of those three places, then you never have to worry about HIPAA. No, not legal advice, but ask your lawyers. They'll say the same thing. Similarly, FERPA, right? FERPA doesn't prohibit transfer in educational data. It only tra prohibits transfers by universities of educational data or other educational organizations. That's not the way anyone else's privacy law works. They're, they work in a data subject as data owner uh, mentality. That means that if it's my data, I control what happens to it, and I have to consent to every new use of my data. This means that the Columbia Record Club, which I stupidly signed up for at 17, because I'm a moron and wanted DVDs, can't just sell my data forever for all purposes if they were in Europe. They can in the United States if we don't live in Europe. So that's the first thing. If you, it's a data-centric and, and data-owner-centric mentality. And if you take data out of the European Union, you have to swear under the Data Protection Directive that it's going to be protected using equivalent or more restring, stringent laws. Secondly is, odd looking but isn't actually hard. The European Commission, which is one of the seven executive bodies of the European Union, it's complicated, um, can look at other countries' privacy laws and say, those are good laws, go ahead and take data there immediately. Those are countries like Canada. Canada has an essentially equivalent set of privacy laws to the European Union, and therefore you can take EU data and send it to Canada for processing without any further agreements or any further uh, practices at all. And that's actually true for a lot of the British Commonwealth countries. They all have essentially the same privacy laws. So the European Commission does a one-line or a one-page report. They say Canada's great, go for it. If you don't fall into the Canada's great, go for it category, however, like for instance us, then they have to negotiate some kind of agreement. So one of those agreements, and this was actually a treaty, was EU-US Safe Harbor. And under Safe Harbor, uh, you could take European data and process it on American systems under certain conditions. And it was managed by the Department of Commerce. Um, and what was required for compliance, and I'll just be clear, I'm going to take a lot of the piss out of the Safe Harbor Agreement, but it's not Commerce's fault, technically. Um, well, one little thing was. Um, so what was required for compliance was that a company had to annually self-certify, I, I, I wasn't a scout, I don't know if it's this or this, it's one of the things, self-certify, I solemnly swear that I'm not going to breach the privacy uh, the privacy obligations on this data of EU citizens. And second, nothing. You had to check a box, sign a form, mail it to the Department of Commerce, and that was 100% of it. So this is kind of a lax enforcement mechanism. Uh, there wasn't like any audits or anything on Safe Harbor. This just happened. And the great part was that there wasn't any like get out and go assigned to the Department of Commerce because we budget like 11,000 times. So 
companies would just copy and paste the logo off the Department of Commerce's website onto their website, and it'd be fine. Like, they got away with this for years. Or they'd have these slightly less shady, but still pretty shady um, option where you have to annually self-certify this. And Commerce, to be clear, would send you many nagging emails. And if you ignore all the nagging emails and keep the logo up on your website, nothing happens. Mostly. Uh, last year, the Federal Trade Commission said, wait, can we enforce this for you, Commerce? And Commerce said, sure, that's fine. So the FTC entered consent decrees with a bunch of companies, including one international security consultancy. Um, and it's a 20-year consent decree that says, I'm not going to lie about safe harbor anymore, which is cool. So someone else also thought that this was very lax, the European Court of Justice, which is a court, and we have to obey rules no matter what Uber says. Um, and in a case brought by an Austrian privacy activist and law student, shout out to the law students, Max Schrems, they ruled that given NSA surveillance, that is, given that if you take data from foreign countries, it's naturally, naturally international connection, and we now know that the NSA monitors and steals all the data in those international connections, and given that there's a lack of any real enforcement against the NSA, that EU US Safe Harbor didn't meet basic human rights obligations that the EU owes to its own citizens. Therefore, they invalidated the whole program effective October. So Safe Harbor is dead. It's now an extremely unsafe harbor. So this is a problem because companies would like to process data. For instance, Facebook, you might have heard of them. They have many faces on their website. They have more photos than anything ever in history, apparently. And this means that Facebook would now have to negotiate individual data protection agreements with 22 different states' parties' data protection commissioners. And if that sounds like an epic disaster, yes, you are correct. So we negotiated a new agreement, and we just negotiated this and got it signed on Tuesday. So this is pretty hot, but not the newest thing I'm going to talk about today. And with a logo design like this, you just know it's going to be a great, well-thought-out agreement. <laughs> so it's a similar arrangement to Safe Harbor. It allows self-certification by businesses, and that's all. But it does say that the Department of Commerce has to search for websites that are lying about uh, Safe Harbor. This means that the Department of Commerce has been instructed by International Accord to learn how to use Google Image Search. So we're moving up in the world, guys. And it also includes binding arbitration under U.S. law, under the Federal Arbitration Agreement, that Europeans can use. Which is weird, because Europeans don't do arbitration the way we do, but they're going to use our arbitration for safe harbor violations, or excuse me, for privacy shield violations. But it gets much better. Remember how the European Court of Justice's big issue was that we didn't enforce anything against our NSA? Well, you'll love to know how that they fixed that. If you want to complain that a U.S. government agency is breaching your rights under Privacy Shield, first, you have to submit a complaint in writing. They say in writing like five times, so I feel like I have to put it on this slide. So in writing, to your National Security Oversight Government Agency, which is weird, because if, if I raised my hand and said, who's our National Security Agency Government uh, Oversight Agency, you would say, I have no freaking clue because, well, there's the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, but he is endowed by Congress with no power. Um, so nobody. And if we say, well, who is it for GCHQ, right, the British one? They used to be in the European Union. I'm, we can look at them as a model. Um, and you say, well, I've watched a lot of James Bond movies, and it, again, it appear, appears to be nobody. And that's actually wrong. It gets worse than that. It's actually Boris Johnson as of this morning. So those of you who know British politics know that we're doomed, right? So then secondly, whoever that agency is, if you can find them, must make a determination that the complaint is not frivolous, vexatious, or made in bad faith, which are lawyer words we use when we want to say, make it up as you go along. <laughs> so that's fine. If you submit this to the German regulators and the Germans are vexed by your complaint because it's not written in good enough German, then they can drop it, but that's fine. If they approve it, they have to submit it to the U.S. Privacy Shield Ombudsperson, and you can always tell when Ombudsperson comes into a conversation that we're in a lot of trouble. So the U.S. On Privacy Shield Ombudsperson will make an independent ter determination of the same vexatiousness requirement, which means that if it doesn't tick off the Germans but does tick us off, we can just drop it on the floor. But let's say you make it through that. Then the Ombudsperson is empowered to write a letter, and the letter will say that everything is fine. This is actually what they say. So I, I will summarize. Again, I won't read all of this for you, but my slides will be online later. What it says is that they will write a letter saying that I investigated and that either everything was already fine or it has been made fine. They will not, this is the bolded part at the bottom, confirm whether your rights were violated or whether anyone was punished or whether, in fact, anything even changed. So good job, guys. 
um, if you don't like this, then the ombudsperson can refer to the Office of the Inspector General of the agency that stole your information. And I think we can all agree that offices of the Inspector General in intelligence agencies are likely to put European priorities first. They always have before. I just ask Angela Merkel. This agreement also includes several letters from different agencies saying, hey, I know we lied last time, but you can trust us now. And I'm sure that unlike every other field of interaction, when we've lied about using protection for data transfer with Europe before and gotten caught, that this time when we say that we're going to use protection for data transfer, despite having not passed any laws, or even a new treaty, by the way, this isn't a new treaty, it's just an executive accord, you can trust us this time. Would I lie again? I think this is really, to quote Pirates of the Caribbean, more of a guideline. <laughs> this was Secretary Pritzker's comment on Privacy Shield, that it's a victory for privacy, individuals, and businesses on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, one for three isn't bad. And Max Schrems, by the way, that Austrian law student, has said that, quote, I don't think there will be a shortage, end quote, of people suing to make the uh, European Court of Justice overturn this for exactly the same reason as they overturned it last time. But in two more years, and this is where it gets really scary, all of this is about to become irrelevant. That's when the EU data protection regulation, which as opposed to the directive, because words are hard, um, takes effect. It has a ton of interesting provisions, but one of them is direct applicability of European Union privacy laws to anyone anywhere in the world, regardless of if they have an EU subsidiary, if they're processing EU citizens' data. Hence, the EU is saying that its laws apply everywhere in the world. That's an interesting thing. We traditionally associate with someone more red, white, and blue, don't you think? <laughs> Keep that in mind as we go on. Let's talk about the right to be forgotten. This is a European right under their data protection directive, same law we were just talking about. In effect, the EU has recognized that it's a human right to remove information that is inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, or excessive in the eyes of the person about whom the information is. So what is this meant in practice? Well, this means that, for instance, a surgeon who botched 50 repeated surgeries asked Google to remove all information from the internet of his previously botched surgeries. Or my personal favorite, a German murderer got out of jail and said, you know, there's a lot of bad press about me. And he murdered like a bunch of people too. I don't remember exactly how many, it was more than one. And he asked for all the information to, about his murders to be removed, and he submitted a request to both German-language Wikipedia, and when they said no, um, he went to Google and said, you have to remove all links to Wikipedia, because they might find out about all those guys I killed. So that's a slight problem. It seems insane, right? But how many of you know what this system is? Few of you. The rest of you, I think, know, but you don't, might not recognize the web design. If you don't know, Wisconsin makes all case records, both civil and criminal and both current and historical, available to the public online for free in real time. It's a huge boon to knowing what the government is doing. It helps keep the court system transparent, and it's generally a great thing. But the downside to this system is that it is trivially easy for anyone to look up long-spent criminal history. For instance, a marijuana possession from the 60s, or a disorderly conduct arrest for protesting the marijuana laws in the 60s. I'm just guessing, because it's Wisconsin. Um, and then deny them employment, or housing, or any other participation in civil society. Now, to be clear, this is, with certain exceptions, illegal, right? If it's a truly irrelevant and truly spent criminal conviction, there's no probation, there's no anything else, this would be illegal to do. But it doesn't come down as, I looked up your criminal history and I think pot is evil, and you were a pothead when you were 18, I know you're 75 now, but now you can't come to our nursing home. It will just happen, right? There's no big red flag, right? It's not even as easy as normal HUD cases on race, for instance, because it's hard to fake backgrounds enough that have significant criminal histories and don't, and then do an A-B testing on what kind of bigot you are. So Europe's approach isn't just crazy. A lot of their cases have revolved around this exact thing, that these people have served their sentences and are, have been adjudged to be rehabilitated. But they can't really be rehabilitated because everyone can just Google what they did. So this undercuts the purpose of criminal justice, which is the rehabilitation of reentrants into society. So it's not just crazy. And in fact, in Wisconsin, we have a great example of why it's not just crazy, because this happens all the time. 
One last note. I noted before that in 2018, the data protection regulation will supersede the directive and involve new extraterritorial rules. And so on the right to be forgotten specifically, the European Commission has said that this will leave no doubt that non-European countries with no European presence must apply European rules. Even more interesting, they're going to reverse the burden of proof so that now, instead of you having to prove to Google that your information is irrelevant, Google will have to prove to you that your information is relevant, which is a strong economic disincentive, er, disincentive because it turns out lawyers are expensive. And they'll be fined hundreds of thousands of dollars if they do it wrong and the data protection regulators find out about it. So this is not good. Legal assistance. It turns out that bad people can exist in other countries. Who knew? Um, when cops want to get evidence and go to a prosecution in the United States, they use things like warrants or subpoenas to compel giving information. For instance, the FBI could issue a warrant to Google to say, give me the contents of this email account. Outside the US, they use mutual legal assistance treaties, which, which what happens is that the US law enforcement, like the FBI, will request that, for instance, Irish law enforcement, the Garda, go serve a warrant on someone, a warrant under Irish law that does essentially the same things that the FBI wants, and then return the evidence. It's a little bit bureaucratic, but it works. And it's not just a US thing, where somehow we make us, ourselves do this. This is what basically every pair of countries does. So the Department of Justice, a couple of years ago, issued a type of warrant called a Stored Communications Act warrant, which is part of the larger Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is a thing that makes Conlon nerds scream bloody murder to Microsoft because a person wanted a connection with some case, and they didn't say what, but put a pin in that, um, had an Outlook.com email account. Um, and Microsoft's response was, hey, Microsoft, this is an EU citizen, so their data is stored by Microsoft Ireland. And I know we have the same logo, but we're not the same company, so please use the MLAT to go get the data from Ireland. And we know you can. This is absolutely in the core of the MLAT. This is what it's for. The U.S. government disagreed. It dislikes being told no. And so they went to a U.S. magistrate court judge in New York City who held Microsoft in contempt of court, which is cool because that can either be a large fine or we can throw Satya Nadella in jail, which could be exciting, and said that the Sword of Communications Act word is part warrant and part subpoena and therefore applies everywhere. And in case you're wondering, that's not like super clear from an actual reading of the law. Regardless of that, though, it's also not clear that we get to do this because there was this thing called a major war, and we ended it with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, and we said that, law, that laws only apply within your borders and not within our borders, and uh, that's how we ended, I think, the War of the Roses. So 1648 is what lawyers like to refer to as well-established principles of law. So if you're curious who on earth the United States government hates enough to prosecute this case for years, and again, just in the discovery phase, they haven't brought charges, it's this guy, Gary Davis, who's one of the administrators of the Silk Road. So once again, we have a situation where the war on drugs is causing new interpretations of international sovereignty, which is always fun. European privacy commissioners told Microsoft that if it complies with the court order, even if it's going to be held in contempt, that it'll be in contempt of European laws and therefore be banned from European competition. This case was out on appeal for a year and a half, but the ruling came down about an hour ago. And the court finally ruled on the side of Microsoft, which is too bad because I had a bet that the Second Circuit didn't care about Europe. Um, so I lose five bucks, so that's fine. But they said, hey, we cross international boundaries all the time, and we are unwilling to apply warrants, which are a traditionally bordered thing. It's one of those reasons that we broke away from Britain in the first place to just say they apply everywhere regardless of territory. That would undermine the whole purpose of having warrants in the first place. So this is good until the appeal, which will be about tomorrow. Finally, we'll end with forced localization. I'm going to go like two minutes over, but I promise you will still get lunch. There we go. Okay, cool. My phone stopped working for a second. So forced localization is the term we give to a very simple principle. If you're in a process or hold citizens, or like our citizens' data, you have to do it within our country. We typically think of this as a thing that only bad countries do, right? Like China's Great Firewall of China, which is referred to by their government as Golden Shield. That's a huge censorship and control operation. And understand, it's an invalid censorship and control operation. They say that's what it's for. But one part of it is using an extreme amount of pressure to make companies that serve information to Chinese citizens do so from within China's borders, which then in turn allows Chinese police and intelligence services to monitor and modify the content much more easily. Alternately, there's Russia, another traditional boogeyman of the West, 
They just passed a law that beginning on January 1st, 2018, all ISPs will be required to keep a copy of all bits that they transmit for six months. Everything, every cat GIF individually. Uh, then they'll be required to keep the metadata about who set the cat GIF to whom around for three years. They will also be required to provide encryption keys to the FSB, which is the modern day KGB, as they transmit encrypted data in real time. This is, of course, nuts. Not least, because, and this is a wonderful thing, there aren't enough data centers with enough hard drives in all of Russia to hold that much data. And the estimated cost is, I believe, tens of billions of US dollars, which is money they don't have, and they have 18 months to build the data centers. So good luck. We know now why a lot of countries are doing it, because we're tired of being told you, your laws don't apply, right? Europe is tired of the US telling them, hey, our Patriot Act trumps your privacy laws. So therefore, we get to search your international data. Canada is told of being, uh, is tired of being told that our Patriot Act trumps their data privacy laws. We're tired of being told that these treaty things trump our, again, USA Patriot Act, Act as it happens. Brazil is tired of everything and everyone and is really tired of us. If you don't believe me, try to get a visa as an American to Brazil. It's exciting now, etc. Everyone is just pointing fingers at everyone else. And it's hard to escape the sense that a good chunk of this was brought on by the Snowden disclosures. But it's not actually the only force in play now. I started out by saying that the lawyers are killing the internet, but I'm not sure that that's actually true. What's happening now is that the forces from our, the hopes from our past of how our future should look are what's becoming a force to shape the internet. We used to believe this, right? This is the famous quote by one of the guys who founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The idea is that somehow the internet will transcend human frailty and become this pinnacle that ends the limitation of information and ultimately ends the limitation of hope to those who need it, whether it's a limitation of hope by governments or a limitation of hope by corporations. Somehow the internet would route around censorship. Instead, we get quotes like this now. When this is from David Cameron, you might have heard of him. He's just gone looking for a new job as he introduced his mandatory internet censorship scheme for England. I don't believe in any freedom of speech. I don't believe that, I don't accept that argument. This cannot be allowed to be how this story ends. As security professionals, we have a responsibility to create robust systems, robust in the face of engineering failures, robust in the face of external threats, regardless of whether they're criminals or militaries or well-meaning but completely nuts politicians. I don't know what the solution is to how we build that kind of system. I know there has to be something better than just giving up. I'm hoping that the people at this conference today will be able to figure out what that solution will be and make it happen. Thank you. So I will sit here for a while. I know it's lunchtime, so you guys can go get lunch. I'm noticeable and wearing all black, so it's easy to see me. Um, and you've got my email address up here. Thank you all very much for your time.